welcome to today's panel discussion. Sensor technology is evolving at a rapid pace. We'll see sensor innovations which enable applications in virtually every industry, from healthcare and automotive to industrial automation and aerospace. Today, our panelists are going to share where the market is going and what is next in sensing. Here to present is David Simpson from Renaissance, Jeff Fortin from Apinal, Arnut Colwyn from Movella, and the moderator today will be Cliff Ortmeyer. Uh, without further ado, uh, here's Cliff. Hey, everybody. Uh, first, I'd like everybody to just uh, give a brief introduction uh, on themselves. Uh, we've got a great panel lined up today. Uh, we've met a couple times. I think you guys are really going to enjoy uh, our discussion today. Uh, again, I'm Cliff Ortmeyer. I'm uh, head of uh, technical marketing as well as uh, North American marketing for Newark Electronics. And um, I've been in the semiconductor industry for uh, many, many years now. Uh, with that, why don't you guys go ahead and introduce yourselves. Uh, Jeff, why don't you go first? Hey, well, first of all, thanks for the invitation to participate. I'm looking forward to the discussions here. So I'm the group technology director for the Amphenol Sensors Technology Group. So we're uh, one of the groups within Amphenol uh, with 12 uh, sensor businesses, 20 brands, 33 sites in 12 countries. So we're all, we're all over the world um, and we design, build, uh, and sell sensors for a whole variety of applications. And I'll tell you a little bit more about the, the sensor technologies and the applications as we go through here. In my, my, in my role, I support technology strategy for the business. I spend a lot of time looking at new technologies, understanding where the market's going, what customer needs are, and supporting all of our business uh, engineering teams. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, Dave, you want to go next? Sure, thank you. Yeah, so, so uh, Cliff and all, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Uh, so uh, my name is Dave Simpson. I'm with Renaissance Electronics, and uh, Renaissance is one of the largest MCU suppliers globally, and we recently broke into the top 10 analog suppliers globally as well. So we're uh, really rounding out the technologies and, and really trying to understand how we can help our customers with systems level solutions. Um, I've been working with um, emerging markets and technology and specifically MEMS, uh, metal oxide and optical technologies for the, the past years. And again, my role within Renaissance is really to uh, to help understand um, the market needs, uh, be able to communicate those back to our development teams and really uh, develop some unique solutions for our, our customers in their own markets. Okay, thanks. And uh, last but not least, uh, Arnaud. Yeah, uh, thanks for, uh, for having me as well. Um, so my name is Arnaud Goedewijn and I work for Movella as a product manager. And I've been with uh, Movella in, uh, for, for more than a decade already. And uh, Movella really focuses on bringing meaning to movement. And we do that mainly on uh, inertial technology, but also on other uh, third party enrichments and such as other uh, other data that users uh, input and uh, give meaning to that. And we do that in healthcare, we do that in sports, in entertainment business, uh, but also in industrial and automation uh, type of applications. Excellent, thanks. Uh, so just to get started today, I wanted to get some, uh, just an overview on sensors in general. And I think Jeff, you've got a slide that kind of highlights some of the standard types of sensors that we all work with on a daily basis. You want to throw that up and just give a quick overview? We'll do. Just give me one second here. All right. Can everybody see that or can you see that? Yep. Okay, great. So th this is a, you know, it's a pretty exciting topic. I've spent my pretty much my 30 year career in sensors. Um, and when we talk about sensors and sensor technology, this is very vast. I mean, there are so many different technologies out there um, with some really interesting underlying physics. There's many, many products made from those technologies from very low cost, you know, MEMS, you know, high accuracy MEMS accelerometers to very expensive, high end uh, uh, trace gas detectors using optical technologies. The space is large, so it, you know, it's hard to focus during this conversation, um, but we're gonna hit on some of the newer technologies and some of the newer applications. This is just to kind of give you an example. Our sensor technology business, uh, you know, our collection of 12 businesses, we have a very broad portfolio of sensor technologies and products. And, and certainly does not encompass the whole market, And but just to kind of give you some ideas, and this is sort of how we look at it, particularly if you look at these top six squares, 
where in the blue box is the fundamental underlying technology and then the products that we make uh, from those technologies are, are, are shown around the box. So, for example, MEMS, and I think we're going to probably spend some more time on MEMS technology. You know, over the last 25, 30 years, it is, has really gone from accelerometer applications, which everybody knows of, of in your airbag, to tire pressure sensors, to blood pressure sensors, to um, significant volume of gas sensor technology uh, is built on MEMS devices uh, today temperature, non-contact temperature for IR applications and gas sensing applications. And so it's it's a really amazing technology and continues to evolve. And you look at examples like materials like piezoelectrics, that, uh, you know, piezoelectric materials, when, when you apply a force, uh, you get a voltage uh, um, and, and vice versa. And so they're great sensing materials. You know, we use them for vibration acceleration sensors for uh, level, fluid level, uh, fluid density, pressure, force, um, and there's just a lot of applications in ultrasonics and, and imaging and so forth with piezoelectrics. And then other ceramics like thermistors. So, uh, you know, in your, in your automotive vehicle, your temperature sensor that you, that you see every day is likely uh, an amphenol uh, a thermistor, which is made fundamentally from ceramic material. It changes resistance with temperature. Uh, put in a, a, a nice package and... and, and um, stuck inside these various applications, uh, you, you get a, a really, really well-developed technology. And you, you can see some of these other ones, optical, chemical, and capacitance. You know, many different sensors are made with optical. What you see there in the that gold-colored uh, right-hand side, that is a non-dispersive infrared CO2 sensor. Um, so it uses a, a light source and a detector uh, and measures the concentration of CO2 in the vehicle or in a room. Um, and we can talk more about air quality later as well. Uh, and then the position sensors. So a lot of autonomous vehicles today, um, industrial robotics, uh, and, and in just automation, you know, you've got a lot of position sensors measuring proximity and position. And some of those fundamental technologies are based off Hall effect and inductance and capacitance and so forth. And so it, it's a really wide range. It, it's hard to cover them all. I, I'll hit on a few of those and I'll hand it over to my colleagues to if they want to cover any other technologies before we get into uh, further discussion. Yeah, yeah, Jeff, that's actually a really good uh, um, I think layout of different technologies. And we're seeing really, really strong growth in uh, some of those because of over the last three or four years, um, we've seen you know the price of sensors um, changing and shifting in some markets. So there's a stronger adoption. Um, that's, you know, partially because of, you know, silicon being used instead of maybe ceramics in some of these applications. Um, we've seen, you know, pre-calibration of some of the sensors uh, in, you know, JETA qualified for long 10-year lives that, that are coming into it. And we've seen also some, um, you know, newer technologies, firmware configurability, which I think we're going to hear a little bit more about some of the, the AI approach. So. Jeff, one question then about all those technologies, is there any one in particular that you see is, is really being the strongest growth or maybe having, uh, maybe being the most interesting in terms of uh, various applications? Yeah, I, I mean, MEMS continues to, to grow in applications and I would say there's more and more being done with it as far as using you know, the manufacturing technology, combining MEMS with other material sets like our metal oxide gas sensors, which I know you're familiar with, where you use a, a thin MEMS membrane and then on it you place a, a nano metal oxide, nano structured metal oxide. And so you're combining these two technologies together. Um, and also MEMS based um, IR light sources. So instead of using a lamp in a, in a, in a IR sensor today, uh, there's a move towards using a microstructured MEMS-based IR emitter, uh, which you get, you can turn it on really fast because it's low, uh, low mass. Uh, and you, so you, can, you can basically cycle it really quickly and it's low power because of that. Uh, and so we, we continue to see MEMS be a large percentage of our portfolio and it continues to grow in applications, but certainly new in, in combination with new materials, MEMS plus piezoelectrics. So there are new sensor applications out there that are being solved by using a MEMS structure with a embedded piezoelectric material on. Uh, but also optical, optical continues to grow, miniaturization of 
you know, going from the lasers down to LEDs to micro optics, uh, filters, very smart filters technology, getting miniaturized onto, you know, in a really small package. It continues miniaturization, you know, getting technology uh, shrunk down, lower power uh, for those battery powered applications, wireless applications, et cetera. But uh, it, there's so much going on, it's hard to focus, but that is an area that we continue to see uh, a lot of opportunity with technology. So yeah, to, just, to just that, I just noticed yeah. the. Uh, sorry, I just noticed no, 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 the, no, no, on the no. slide that the one sensor I was was missing is really the gyroscope, um, um, and maybe just partly because you don't don't make them, maybe. But now we see a lot of use of, of gyroscopes and also integrated uh, systems of gyroscopes with when when combined with an accelerometer uh, to make it uh, a six DAF or even nine DAF with a magnetometer. And uh, also, really, not abused there in, in anything that basically that moves. I guess everybody uh, here in the room and also uh, listening uh, now or later has a gyroscope within one meter. And then I'm, of course, uh, referring to your phone. Um, and then there's a gyroscope in your phone, there's a gyroscope maybe even in your laptop. Um, so, uh, just tracking the motion and the gestures that you do with the device. Um, so, I think uh, also a lot of inertial sensors in that way are used. Right. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, I think, a, that's uh, a great point. I, I think, um, you know, it's an area that we don't do much in. That's why you didn't see it on the slide, like you said. But certainly in autonomous yeah. vehicles and anything autonomous, you know, IMUs, which include the gyroscopes and accelerometers, you know, GPS, optical sensors, radar, LIDAR, you know, these, these technologies are, uh, you know, highly used in autonomous vehicles and in non-autonomous vehicles today for safety. So those are things I didn't touch on, but that's that's also a, definitely a growth area. And they're coming down in cost. They're be becoming more capable of seeing objects at you know further distances, discriminating different objects. Uh, it, so this that space is really evolving quickly. Yeah, so I think. One of the things uh, one of you guys touched on, and, and my background, you know, uh, I used to work for. Um, uh, semiconductor manufacturer that really started out in the the true MEMS sense. And when I thought about MEMS, it was always basically, you know, measuring some kind of a fulcrum, measuring the capacitance change and taking something from there. But I mean, uh, when we talk about MEMS, it's much wider than that, right? I mean, even the gas sensors, one of the things I'd like to get from you guys is help, uh, help us understand, you know, how some of the different types of uh, sensors work that are not just a straight capacitive MEMS sensing. I mean, what are other kinds of sensors uh, are there and how they how do they operate you know in terms of their their uh, technology say for instance gas do you guys want to throw some out there just to give uh, people an understanding sure um, maybe I can I can take this one so yeah I just this is actually then um, yeah it's a really really strong growth market and, and one of the one of the areas though when we we were actually I was in a group that was acquired by IDT then Renaissance and we first came in, um, you know, we had MEMS technology and IDT had had um, another version of MEMS that wasn't doing anything to do with air quality that they didn't have very much success with. And I was told when we first came in, don't mention MEMS. <laughs> MEMS is a bad thing. And so uh, anyway, we had to educate some people on, on you know, the different applications that MEMS-based sensors support. But but effectively what, what you know we're seeing as well is there's you know, if you use a silicon metal hot plate, so you, you take a MEMS device and you can you can heat it up. Um, you know, it's a really small uh, device. It's uh, it's in a, a silicon substrate, and you can heat it up between 100 degrees and you know 400 degrees C. And with that, you can then have a deposition of a metal oxide material on top of that. It could be a tin oxide or tungsten oxide. And if you uh, heat that up and you look at the resistance levels, you can look at signatures that tell you what gas families that you're, you're seeing. So, so the, the one example of MEMS that I'm describing now is, is really um, heating a piece of silicon up, um, having resistant material, looking at those gas uh, uh, signatures, and we're actually using sweeping techniques. So we can go from 100 degrees to 125 to 150 up to you know 400, and sulfur dioxide, different ga different gas families have dis different resistances. So with that, we can actually start determining families of, of gases we're seeing in an environment. So just to kind of and so with that, then there's an analog output to that, and we have a you know a digital 
um, sensor signal conditioner that, that would pick that up and and uh, be able to interpret that and, and have an I squared C output. So um, that's just a kind of a short overview of some of the mem, the mem structures relative to air quality. I'm sure uh, Jeff and our new probably have other examples as well of mems based uh, devices. Yeah, I think that's that's a great example. And uh, yeah, along the same lines, we have a new product where we, we use a similar structure without the metal oxide, um, but we use it as a, a um, basically a temperature um, or a thermal conductivity sensor. So imagine if you're heating that thin membrane up and you're measuring uh, the temperature of it or the resistance of the resistive network, or you're monitoring how much power you have to put in to keep it at a constant temperature. And then the gas environment changes um, and you have a higher thermal conductivity gas, then you can basically measure the, the conductivity of that gas. Um, and therefore you can measure the concentration of the gas. So one of the applications I may talk a little bit more about later is in a battery thermal runaway for electric vehicles, where uh, what we've found is that um, when these batteries break down, electrolytes uh, uh, give off hydrogen among other gases. And you can detect that and determine when a battery cell is starting to fail before a fire breaks out. Mm -hmm. uh, so this thermal conduct, MEMS-based thermal conductivity sensor is, is you know, core technology to there. And, and other companies use it for flow sensing, right? Using a thermal MEMS-based thermal conductivity sensor for flow sensing in, in medical applications and other air and fluid applications. And so this this sort of micro hot plate technology gets applied in, in many different applications. It seems like that's a pretty pretty common type of scenario in terms of being able to detect gases. It's a, a variation of, uh, of heating basically uh, and checking out the resistance or some other kind of um, uh, some other um, element that you're that you're trying to monitor, but uh, does that does that? Uh, I, don't, I don't know if you guys have any experience with it or not, but I know I'm always amazed at uh, how like uh, being able to find nuclear material and stuff like that. You know, they they talk about just the tiniest parts per million, and I think how is that even possible? I mean, do any of you guys have any experience with that? I, I don't think any of you design those things, but uh, anybody know anything about that? Yeah, I've got yeah, I've got Cliff one uh, one thing. So this is going back ten or twelve years, and uh, I was living in upstate New York, and I uh, I had a, a nuclear stress test uh, that was done, and uh, so they they go through and they can actually look at, at your cardiovascular health and such. So anyway, it was it was at least two weeks later. I drove from there up to Montreal for a meeting, and uh, I had a meeting. Everything was fine. I was driving back through, and I pulled up to the, the border coming back into the U.S. and for people in all that area, it's just around north of Watertown where you come back across that, that bridge. And uh, the guy started asking me questions and he and he asked more questions than was normal. And so this went on for four or five minutes and uh, he's almost like, and so anyway, I looked ahead and there was two guys with their hands and their guns looking at me. I looked at them, I looked back at the guy, I said, what, what's going on? He said, nah, you need to get out of the car. You got, you're setting off our, our nuclear sensors. I said, you gotta be kidding me. So anyway, they got me out of the car um, they took my car, they drove it into some building, and then a guy walked up to me and uh, took me into a building, and, and his, he had like this Geiger counter was just clicking away. And he went in, and then he had, they had to use a much bigger device or specialized device to see if it was uh, medical grade isotope, which, which it was. But it was uh, crazy that two weeks later, I would still have, um, I was still lighting up detectors, sitting in a car and going through some kind of a bridge. So I don't have much experience in that other than a bad experience. Oh. Yeah, but that's just crazy. I mean, think about it. Two weeks later, you're in your car and you're driving up, and they can they can detect that. That's that's just what amazes yeah. me about the the sensitivity and the sensors, and that's why this is such a a crazy uh, a crazy topic that uh, you know I think a lot of us have just don't understand all the different types of technologies needed to build all these types of sensors. You know. One of, one of the ones that uh, I was wondering, we, we were talking earlier about um, like, you know, the blood, uh, the blood pressure monitors. And I know a lot of things that uh, uh, people are always wondering about, like with smart watches and with, you know, the, with COVID, you know, the pulse oximeters and stuff like that. What other types of technologies are used? Because uh, you see, I always see different colored uh, lights and things like that uh, on my, my pulse ox and on my watch. 
what are what are some of the technologies that are used there and how are you know how are they determining uh either blood flow or oxygen levels any guys got any experience on that i actually we we do a little bit as well so um with renaissance we do have a, a solution out and uh in yeah so normally with your, your apple watch you'd see at night whatever a green led is showing um, and so you can use green or red. The green is better on the wrist because it doesn't reflect off your bone. The red is, you know, the, the bone actually acts like a mirror and you can't get good reading. So if you use a red, it's, it has some benefits, but the applications, you got to be in soft tissue. And so what we're seeing is um, applications such as um, obviously the ring, uh, you're seeing that it has that basic technology. But we're also seeing other companies that you know, for authentication devices. If you are authenticating yourself with your finger, it also takes us a couple seconds to get a good bio reading on you as well to give you your your you know, your uh, blood your um, uh, SpO2, your blood oxygen levels, um, your heart rate, a lot of different things. So, um, you know, and you think about it, there's there's also for hospitals and clinical things, they they give you this device now in some places where you, you hold on to it and it does all, all your vitals, and you know that's that's where they kind of quantify your health when you go in. So, uh, yeah, so I think that the, the and then there's another uh, device, too, that's coming out that if you leave a hospital, it's like a patch that goes on you that for some period of time can give you, you know, really with, an, you know, it's, I think it's a, it's a wireless connection. I'm not sure which one it is, but it gives you that, that feedback and the hospitals can monitor to you when, you're, when you've gone home. So I think the, the technology and the implementation of the technology is really um, finding the new homes now. And it's, you know, very interesting and it, it's really helping people in, in health. Hmm. Almost like a sensor fusion, right? Yeah, exactly. Got, uh, yeah, exactly. I was, got... I was really thinking about one of the, the, the products that we have, uh, and it's called the, uh, the DOT. And it's really a small sensor which, which combines a, an IMU uh, with, uh, with mobile technology. And uh, we've seen applications where people have an injury and need to do some rehabilitation. Uh, and instead of going to the physiotherapist all the time, uh, they, there's an app that you that instructs you on where to put, for example, the, the, the sensor on your arm uh, to, to re regain the movement. We can, we can check really what sort of deflection and extension is of the, of the limbs and, and the doctor can get a report on the progress. And you can even sort of gamify it where you say, hey, you have to have to do some sort of a controller with your arm and, and in that way you do some, some exercises. And uh, I think that's really exciting type of applications that bring the healthcare from the hospital to the home and make it a lot more accessible, uh, also through technology and through sensing. I think it's really nice. Any other any other types of um, uh, technologies? Uh, obviously, piezo. Most of us uh, have understand you know some basics about piezo. We talked about gas. Uh, you know, I guess photo or would that be considered photoacoustic? Um, you know, any other technologies that uh, that any of the sensors are based on that we might not actually understand how they're actually how, how they're working that are not just a straight inertial or mechanical type thing. I'm not sure if it's if it really fits under sensors, but I think GPS is uh, also quite exciting. Uh, we all know GPS uh, through the, the set map we have in the car. And, you know, 10, 20 years ago, everybody was exciting that they could navigate and it was so accurate. Um, I always like to, to tell that, you know, the, the set maps back in the day, they were a little bit cheating uh, because they knew your approximate position and they had a map and they know that, you know, you're a car. So you put them on the road and not next to it. Uh, you always see them seem jumping a little bit if, if there's a bad reception. Um, but right. things that are really um, coming up right now is sort of the, the technology to increase the accuracy of the GNSS position estimates that you can. Uh, typically, GPS uh, uh, you get in your phone is about two meter, three meter, uh, maybe five meter, depending on where you are accurate. But nowadays, you can get um, small uh, receiver chips which can receive uh, correction signals from the GNSS satellites, and that can uh, get the position down from uh, the, the the big two meter to maybe 10, 20 centimeters or a foot type of of uh, uh, distance. And uh, even going further down, there's this real-time kinematics, which is really sending uh, correction signals from a fixed base station that you have, that you have the known position of, and through the internet, send the correction signal to your rover, as they call it, and where you are, uh, where you want to measure. 
and you can get down to two centimeter or even a little bit lower than that in positioning and just thinking about the type of applications you can do with position uh of down to a centimeter uh, right yeah it's it's like amazing yeah actually a, a good a good question came up and actually it's a nice uh, segue into the next piece so so we understand you know how some of the different uh you know technologies work but what are what do you guys see as the the main uh the next phase in terms of mems and other types of technologies what applications do you guys see as being the biggest areas for growth you know what's what's on the current horizon you know what's happening today and the near future where do you see the biggest growth areas i know one of the ones we've been talking about here is uh, healthcare what do you guys what do you guys see like applications where we might not even know that what kind of sensors are being used in those applications or peop sensors that uh, people are looking at. Any thoughts in terms of like, so let's say, start with healthcare? Yeah, I think in, in healthcare, um, a lot of things uh, will become a lot smarter. And of course, that's, that's a general uh, term, but I think there's a lot of sensors which can be combined. Um, so, uh, for example, in your smartwatch, uh, you have your your inertial sensors. You have your uh, your your SPO2. You have your maybe your your ECG or EEG uh, blood pressure. Um, but also combining the the data from the sensor that you have, you know, you can you can maybe detect more like the posture or the gait or the balance or step size. Maybe even track location without GPS, which could uh, elongate the the battery life. Um, and you know, that's that's really what you can do. Uh, with the smartwatch while you're while you're going and monitoring it yourself and then you have after the, the exercise you can do uh, maybe uh, lock lock that on your mobile device and get get information about training or coaching or, or uh, share with your social networks uh, but also do reports on performance uh, predictions of uh, maybe injuries which may coming on uh, you can imagine marathon runners uh, at the beginning of the marathon they're really fit having a good technique you know at the end they get tired and your technique deteriorates uh, and you can get signals from your device that you carry that you say hey what's your technique because uh, if you go on like this much longer you might get an injury uh, all sort of that type of applications really looking into the data uh, yeah it's really exciting to me yeah it's uh, it's the that's where i guess that's for the other pieces i mean you have the sensors but you know, what you've been talking about is great, you got all these sensors, but how do you take all that input? Like the gate, you know, just checking on somebody's gate can tell numerous types of things. So being able to do all the sensor fusion along with the analytics, I think that's probably where the, you know, one of the big next revolutions is, is how do we take all this information and give, you know, real solid feedback to people? Uh, I think I think that's a big area that is just gonna continue to expand, you know, like, like you said. Um, what about uh, anything from, yeah, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to give you a couple areas. You know, in medical yeah. device field, certainly the continued drive to continue to miniaturize, try to get more functionality like inside of a catheter tip, for example. So our next generation MEMS pressure dye is just a couple hundred micron uh, wide. Uh, you know, that's a, that's a full pressure dye, full bridge pressure that's dye. Crazy. and. Uh, you know, you add, you know, put that and add a, a add a thermistor to that, and you can get, uh, you know, pressure and temperature at, at the tip of a catheter die and take up very, very little space, so that the catheter can be used to other things. And um, you know, one of the areas it's it's not really a sensor, but you you can combine these piezoelectric materials for ultrasonic imaging, but you can also use them for ablation. So we have mm -hmm. products uh, again, very small size piezoelectrics instead of being used as a sensor, but being used as an actuator to focus high intensity ultrasound to uh, do ablation of uh, you know, cancer cells and such inside the body, again, in a very small footprint. Um, and uh, so, so continue to, to shrink things down into these, uh, these type of applications for catheters and such. And maybe another area kind of related to this is medication and drug manufacturing and pharmaceuticals. And so not only do you need to monitor and validate the manufacturing process, and so you know, we have products like that will measure temperature, pressure, and gas concentration inside of a pharmaceutical manufacturing process to make sure 
that processes manufacturing that drug per the, the spec, right? It's regulated industry. Um, that, those systems are moving to wireless. We've got, you know, wireless. Uh, and to our notes, uh, sort of what his business does is that data now gets collected. Um, it goes to the cloud and our customers can view that data, look for long-term trends and, and use this data in any way that they want in the cloud rather than on a PC back in the, in the QA lab. So that it continues to evolve here. And last area, I think this is really interesting and this in, in bio pharmaceutical manufacturing. So the biologicals, we know that they're, they're moving from these very large stainless steel, high volume manufacturing um, vats, if you will, or facilities um, to these disposable, smaller volume uh, manufacturing uh, equipment for smaller dose as well, or, or smaller volume as well as R&D. And along with those small systems comes disposable sensors. So they'll actually use a plastic bag in, in this industry to manufacture biological drugs. Um, and these, these bags are lower volume up to like 2000 liters down to you know a few liters depending upon R&D, um, what they're doing for R&D. And they'll have pressure, temperature, flow, um, um, con conductivity, pH sensors that will all get thrown away at the end of the process um, because it's cheaper and more efficient to do that than to take a large stainless steel vat and clean it and get it through the whole cleaning process and using the chemicals and making sure it's fully sterilized, et cetera. So this is another really interesting area for sensors because they, they need to be really low cost, but they still need to be accurate and help control the manufacturing process. Yeah, maybe I can just build on Jeff's uh, one comment about miniaturization. So we're involved yeah. in another application as well that uh, it, it's really, it's an implantable um, device, a little bigger than a grain of rice, it's um, for diabetics. And so what we're doing is measuring blood glucose. So in that there's a UV optical device that's looking you know, from inside, you know, towards the surface of that uh, device. And that device is coated with material that reacts to blood sugar, blood glucose. And with that, you can actually get, you know, that, that kind of close loop feedback of what someone's um, levels of sugars are, blood glucose levels, and that then tie back to a pump and you get the kind of artificial pancreas per se that could kind of come together. But yeah, look at miniaturization, it's really crazy where this is going, if you think about it, that's just this one application. You think about um, somebody that has a cardiovascular event, they have a heart attack, before they have a heart attack, they have oh. some type of enzymes that, you know, the hospitals always check for if they think you have a heart attack, you think where that could go in the future. And so I think implantables um, are, are really interesting as well. And it goes back to miniaturization and then bringing data back out that really helps individuals out. Yeah. Or just a question, a question from my side also, uh, thinking about it. Um, are you also working a lot with microfluidics, uh, doing uh, sort of lab on a chip type of applications? It sort of edges against sort of MEMS or, or uh, miniaturization of lab environments. We, we don't um, we don't work in that space. We, we really do very few sort of chemical or biological sensors, but that is definitely in the chemical detection or bio detection or medical yeah. devices using microfluidics and, and MEMS based manufacturing to build small microfluidic devices, pumps, valves, uh, and then using optical detection techniques and such. You know, that's that's yeah. becoming more and more more common. That's a good point. We yeah, talk yeah, really, yeah. Sort of what triggered me was also sort of the the medication manufacturing. I know also from experience that uh, we have a couple of companies here in the area where and they make microfluidic chips and they can do very very minute uh, mixing machines and droplet generators and and all sorts of complex things. And and also there are sensors and detectors and they can do DNA sequencing. Um, and, um, yeah, and it's, it's amazing on how small scale and small chips they can do it. Um, and also uh, on the medical side and healthcare at home, uh, thinking about, for example, um, the uh, getting blood values uh, from, from medical devices at home. I know about an application where uh, people can measure the, the lithium content in the blood uh, to make sure that they get the proper medication at home. Um, you know, and that's, that's all based on uh, getting a really tiny drop of blood into a microfluidic chip and then measuring what kind of chemicals are, are in the blood and uh, in this case, then lithium, 
to see if they yeah what the doses of that is in the blood and if they need another uh, dose or not or uh, to get get their health checked yeah you guys you guys still had me at the fact that you're putting you know multiple sensors in the tip of a catheter and you know i think we all know where a <laughs> catheter goes and i'm just I'm just like, wow, that's, that's friggin' amazing. It's just incredible how small things are getting. And, you know, the, the thing is rice, you know, it's the stuff that we saw, you know, five, ten years ago. We thought, ah, that's, that's so far out. But, uh, you know, it, it's crazy that things have come there. You know, one, one area that, uh, that I've seen a lot of ramp up of, and I, and I honestly haven't understood the purpose for them, but I see a lot more environmental type uh, uh, sensors these days. Do you guys... You guys do anything with environmental sensors and why, you know, what are the applications for them other than, you know, just measuring, you know, CO2 or something like that? What, what are the applications? Because I see a lot more coming out and it seems like there's a lot of growth, but what do you guys see and what, what are the applications that we see for that one? Uh, so, yeah, certainly, yeah. I, I talk a little bit about, um, yeah, our, you know, air quality is, particularly with, with COVID, kind of ramped this up, I would say. But, you know, believe it or not, in high-end automobiles, there are air quality sensors inside the automobile measuring the amount of, uh, you know, nitrogens and nitrous oxides in the atmosphere um, inside the vehicle, measuring particulates. So looking at anything greater than two microns in diameter. Um, and then using that information to control the HVAC system and whether they pull in fresh air from outside or they, they close the HVAC and, and recirculate air from inside to, to make sure you have fresher air rather than the air from outside. Um, and so that's, that's really more for, for health related issues. Same thing inside oh. buildings. You know, so, so we have one new product. Um, it's called our multifunctional sensor for, for automobiles, which has, uh, three MEMS devices integrated uh, for three different gas gases. It has a temperature sensor and a moisture sensor, and it's used for um, HVAC system control, and again monitoring all the the aspects as well as the condensation point for your windshield, and it's used to control the HVAC system. And then to take the same kind of concept and move it inside a building, uh, and so you know building control systems. That are optimizing efficiency and energy look at how much co2 is in the building so basically how many people are in the building determines the co2 level once the co2 level gets up to a thousand ppm or 1200 ppm uh, data shows people can get lethargic etc um, and so what uh, what you do with the with a co2 sensor that's mounted on the wall is you once that data shows that you're above 1200 uh, ppm or in that area they'll bring in more fresh air. Um, but every time you bring in fresh air, you got to treat it, you got to cool it, you got to maybe add moisture, take moisture out, you got to heat it. And so these systems are optimized um, for, for how to you know, efficiently make sure the air we breathe is clean and fresh. So those are, those are a couple of examples I can give you. Wow. Yeah, that, that, it, oh, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say, is that common? I mean, actually the car one I'd never even heard about before I could see where if you're sitting in a, uh, you know, sitting in traffic or something where that would actually be useful. But uh, I mean, are these things going in buildings right now or is this kind of we kind of in the early stages or has this been around for a while? The, the building CO2 has been around for quite a while. It's called demand control ventilation. But now they're adding, you know, more air quality. They're looking for other gases, looking at particulates. So we sell optical based, you know, particulate sensors. They call uh, yeah. basically use a. An LED uh, and a detector, and you look for deflection or off of the light, or basically reflection off of the uh, of the light off of the particles, and you can size the particles and determine what the you know, particle density is. So, so that's fairly common yeah. in in the vehicle. It's, it's fairly new, but it's growing rapidly. It's it's a it's in a number of vehicles, um, and you just uh, you just don't know it. But uh, there's particulate sensors in the vehicles, and there's air quality sensors, and and the control systems are. are, are keeping things fresh. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. There's, I'm there's sorry, actually, uh, no, I'm sorry. Good. Yeah. So there's, there's, uh, there's indoor air quality and outdoor air quality are kind of two ways you can 
you can look at this as well. And uh, and some things Jeff was talking about in your in your air quality um, in the in the PM, the things have been uh, you know I guess defined as um, over the years as good or bad. Um, are definitely being measured now. But one of the newer areas uh, is volatile organic compounds. There's never a clear definition of indoor air quality with respect to this family of gases, the VOCs. And they can be um, carcinogenic, they can be formaldehyde, they could be you know, some mild irritants from cleaning products and such. And so these are the things that, um, the, there's a group in Germany called, uh, the German Environmental Agency was the first to kind of put together a definition of these gases of what you should do for how long you should be in that environment and then when you should you know leave or something else but that's all changing now there's um in addition to uber there's a wells group well standard out of north america is, is defining that aspect of it there's a reset group it's out of asia there's a new ul spec that's coming out as well for for buildings homes and buildings and so they're quantifying uh the the, the pm levels they're quantifying co2 obviously they're quantifying um the the TVOC, total volatile organic compounds. So that's a big growth there. That's indoor air quality, and it's really taking off because now there's clear definitions and standards that are, that are really coming into play. The second piece is the outdoor air quality, and it's some of the things that, you know, gases like uh, ozone or nitrogen dioxide from vehicle emissions, those are the things that if you look at, um, if you're in Austin or wherever you're at, and look at the air quality index, they may say it's uh, three, four, five, whatever it is, um, but that's by definition wrong, because if you are on, if there's a highway coming through and you and traffic and you're on the highway and there's a west wind coming, you do not want to pull air into your building. You want to recirculate. You're going to have really bad air quality. And there's a lot of studies that are showing that people that do live near highways have higher rates of neurological type disorders uh, later in life. So I think there's the outdoor air quality piece of it is really taking off. And these are there's a lot of low cost sensors that can bring both indoor and air quality, indoor and outdoor air quality together. And this is where I know probably comes in the middle of it as well is, is then how do you get systems to, be, to become intelligent? They can look at both air quality and recirculate or you know, decide when, where they should be um, you know, drawing in fresh air. Huh. I guess that clears up a lot of my questions about why we need all the air quality sensors. I think the the regulations, that's probably one thing that'll help drive a lot of this. If, if there's actually groups looking to see, you know, kind of like, uh, you know, when you go and get, uh, when you work around radiation or whatever, you know, they measure that, you know, what the C standards are. It sounds like we're getting more and more uh, like that, but more around, uh, you know, environmental, uh, environmental, uh, you know, hazards and things like that. So. Makes, makes a lot of sense. Um, what about, uh, I know one area that a lot of us always see, and it's kind of a, the hot buzz topic right now in terms of industrial, uh, like there's predictive maintenance and uh, a lot of the autonomous machines, you know, self-driving cars and everything like that. You know, you've got LiDAR and all these other types of technologies that are really starting to starting to take off. Where, where do you guys see things heading from an industrial standpoint or even automotive? I think for for once, I think it's um, really good to see that a lot of these sensors are getting a lot cheaper, and we touched that already a little bit. That uh, they're even becoming uh, disposable, um, so that makes it uh, much more accepted in the market and much easier to to integrate. And uh, even the cheaper cars have have more sensors nowadays instead of only the high end cars. Um, and going to um, to automation and, and autonomous vehicles, I think. Uh, it's always a thing about uh, um, uh, return on investment. Uh, so if you have a really, really expensive uh, autonomous vehicle, yeah, is, is it worthwhile or just put a human on it, right? So uh, the, the reduction in cost, I think, is, is really important. Um, and secondly, I think uh, there's also in the last years with uh, all the COVID situations and uh, the, uh, the shortage of qualified personnel, um, yeah, a lot of things are happening in the world of automation in, in logistics, for example, uh, with all people staying at home. Uh, you had more people ordering online. Uh, more people ordering online means bigger warehouses. Bigger warehouses means more people to get all the orders, but all the people are at home. So a uh, solution there is, is going autonomous and, and automate the, the warehouses. Um, and and there, there's a lot bigger uh, uh, amount of products to choose from. So uh, normal warehouses are becoming uh, 
yeah, logistically challenging. Yeah? So you want to be flexible. You want to be able to to adapt on uh, on, on trends, on maybe even day to day curves of, of interesting products for for different uh, different people. Uh, so you want to have a flexible warehouse and um, yeah, autonomous vehicles or uh, AGVs or AMRs in that sense are yeah, really enabling that. Uh, but to have an autonomous vehicle and uh, to look back, you need, for example, a LiDAR, or you need a camera, or you need uh, ultrasonic sensors, or you need, uh, for example, an IMU. All these different things are individual sensors and they can all do a single thing, but not one sensor can do everything. Um, so and then comes the, the challenge to tie them all together because the LiDAR uh, knows sort of what's what's in the in the in the vicinity or what, what's open space. But uh, yeah, where do you need to go? Or is there uh, perhaps something uh, above the, the range of the LiDAR? Do you need a camera for that? Or uh, is there maybe a bump in the road which is not seen and you need an inertial sensor for that? And tying that all together, I think, is, is the sensor fusion to make sure that uh, the, the, the pro and uh, the, the strong points of one sensor is being compensated by another sensor and, and combining all the data and making proper use of it, I think is uh, is really where we're, where we're heading. Yeah, it seems like there's a lot of, um, you know, movement from, uh, from that area over to uh, agricultural. Um, you guys see, you guys see a lot of uh, similarities between there or uh, any other types of sensing technologies? I mean, what, what are we doing in agriculture? Because, you know, I've heard about the GPS. Yeah, I think agriculture, I think, yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. Agriculture, I think, is also really interesting. And uh, nobody wants to be a farmer nowadays, unless you have, the, of course, the, the few very passionate uh, ones. Uh, but also there we see a lot of automation going on. Um, and we touched a little bit on the, the, the accurate uh, gene assess with RTK technology. And if you think about you want to spray your crops, uh, you want to have a tractor which goes just uh, uh, in between the line of crops and not just over the line of crops. So uh, being very accurate there is, is very important. Um, and uh, then you can, for example, use uh, a drone with a camera on uh, below to, to look at your crops. And uh, besides uh, normal optical cameras, you can also use hyperspectral cameras. And with a hyperspectral camera, you can even see uh, the growth stage of your of your crop, or even determine different types of crops, or uh, and where you need to have more fertilizer or not, and, and be more efficient and also environmental friendly. There, um, um, I've seen applications where uh, you have small robots driving over crops. And uh, especially in the, the very early stage of crop growth, uh, you want to make sure that the weeds are being taken out. Um, and uh, using optical cameras and image recognition, machine learning, AI, and uh, they can determine which is a crop and which is weed, and then use a high power laser to, to burn off the weeds. Uh, all those types of applications, you know, it's yeah, crazy that, you know, that that's possible nowadays. Yeah. yeah. Um, anything else, you guys, from the from the agricultural standpoint? No, I think it's really it's, it's a really cool space. You know, smart ag and and what they're doing on the vehicles, like Arno was mentioning. Uh, yeah. You know, with lidar and radar and you know, integrating GPS and IMU, so really autonomous, really moving to autonomous vehicles, as well as having you know weather stations out in the field measuring local precipitation measuring wind speed so if you're going to apply a, you know a treatment you understand the wind speed and where it's going to blow and i mean the, this whole system level view of farming is really really changing uh including 5g networks and uh LoRaWAN and low power wireless networks you know on a farm taking data from the sensors all over the farm and integrating that data and then using that data for information to control the, the operations, to control the plan. So there's there's some really interesting things going on in this smart ag space. Just like mm -hmm. it, just like in the factory, just think about moving the factory out into the field, you know, taking data from your equipment, from from the environment, um, and then and then using that to, to optimize your, your farming. Yeah. 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 Yeah, exactly. That, yes. That's also what we see that uh, people want to take different sources of information. Uh, you see, you have, you have your, your weather information or even the, the prediction of that. And you have your, your local sensors and how does, 
how does that compare your, your local sensors with whatever the, uh, the, uh, the weather forecast is and uh, determining should I uh, even spray my fields now because uh, maybe uh, there's uh, some rain coming and it's not necessary or uh, there's, the, there's other things coming along. Uh, uh, even uh, air quality outside can be interesting to, to take, uh, take into account. A lot of things that can be can be tied together, and uh, yeah, without uh, that could even mean sort of indirect sensing that you don't use sensors but uh, other types of sensors to measure something which is not actually measured but uh, can be deducted from whatever quantities you're measuring. Right. Any other any other applications? Uh, I know we briefly one of the ones that I thought was really interesting when you were talking about sensing in the batteries. Um, was the fact that you know I do a lot of RC stuff and we always read about you know the batteries when they puff, not supposed to charge and everything like that because I guess they're outgassing and things like that. But uh, I don't think the batteries that I use have any kind of sensors like that in there. Is there any other kind of sensors uh, in terms of batteries? Uh, any other kind of advancements in battery or automotive technology that you guys uh, see coming up that either for safety or for even just efficiencies? I mean, the, the whole electric vehicle and is space is just, uh, you know, exploding and and on and from a, just generally, if you look at electric vehicles and, and moving from the, you know, the internal combustion engine to electric vehicles, we see two to three X the number of sensors being required on electric vehicles than on uh, internal combustion engine based vehicles. Um, everything from you mentioned the battery, you know, inside the cells or on top of the cells or ideally embedded between cells you, you need to, to measure the temperature because the the temperature of the battery uh, is really important in optimizing charge and discharge there's heating and cooling systems inside the battery um, wrapping you know sending fluid through and around the cells to control the temperature uh, and so there's yep. multiple uh, you know dozen potentially or more in some cases temperature sensors you know, in these batteries there's uh, current sensing. So current sensing is a really current and voltage, really big applications now. Uh, you know, you, you want to monitor the, the state of health of the battery. You want to control it through your, the proper charge and discharge cycles. You need to balance the battery cells. So this whole battery health monitoring and these battery management systems require voltage, temperature, current sensors. Uh, and that's just at the battery. And then you move out to the to the the power drives, the electric motors that need you know position sensors and temperature sensors inside the windings, and it, it just it, it just grows and grows uh, on 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 these electric vehicles. And so it's it's a yeah. really interesting space. And you know we were worried about you know is this going to change our automotive sensor market? But it's actually growing the market for sensors, growing the opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's, there's also, uh, it's really interesting, the different technologies coming together, we've been able to solve some problems with uh, wearable devices. So if you look at um, some of these MEMS-based resistive sensors, you know, going, going to uh, the silicon substrate, the substrates that are extremely small now, they can fit inside a, a watch or a phone. And then that with um, sweeping techniques and use a, a neural network approach to be able to take lots of data mm -hmm understand it, and then use an embedded AI. Um, we've got solutions now, our sensors that can you know, run off batteries, um, that can run off watches, run off phones, and you'll start seeing these in the market, um, you know, primarily looking at the different kinds of air quality, indoor outdoor air quality. But I think there's, um, there's the, you're gonna see, I think a really strong emergence of um, these environmental sensors that are extremely low power, that can be worn on us or, you know, out in, in a battery operated environment to be able to Kind of look at look look for us and alert us if we're in a condition that's uh, not healthy and, and such. Yeah, I, th I think that's a big that's that's really the big piece is that it's no longer a single sensor measuring one thing. Everything is becoming around sensor fusion, which means you guys have to understand the applications as well as the other types of sensors that you need to build in, as well as the software you know and the and the machine learning and AI that needs to accompany all that stuff. So. It's really, it's really a complex and a, an amazing space. Uh, we got about uh, five minutes before we wrap up, so I, I have one more question for you guys. If anybody has any questions that you'd like to ask, throw it in the Q and A, and we'll try and get it in here. Um, but while we're seeing if we have any questions, uh, I did want to ask 
what's the next thing? So we've talked about a lot of the stuff that's happening, you know, right now or in the near future. Long term, what what do you guys see as being the next thing for sensing? What are the big ones? Um, yeah, I think the uh, the the metaverse is is a thing that uh, we did not touch yet, and I think is also maybe a little bit untouchable still. Uh, uh, but I think there's quite a lot uh, potential there of of, of sensing. Uh, we see that uh, the metaverse you want to have. Um, yeah, your your virtual presence and uh, you want to be communicating with with other people maybe uh, how, how do you capture that um uh, i think uh, in in one of our previous sessions we also talked a little bit about uh, previously at yeah, tv with with vision and and sound and uh, what about smell uh or or other things maybe we don't even want that but who knows um uh, but in general i think what's what's coming is really and uh, of making life easier uh, i think all the things we, we talked about if it is it if it's about the the environment uh, in your home in your car or with agriculture or with uh, uh, all the, uh, the, the other autonomous machines it's, it's also about making life easier and um, but also about uh, yeah your health and your well-being and being before you get injured uh, and have, have pointers of of uh, yeah getting and don't do that anymore or use this or uh, but uh, not only for humans but also for machines uh, so i think yeah making making life easier is, is is one of the things that's really coming up right and maybe also driving this industry true true actually in terms of driving industry an interesting uh, question came up is uh Asking about uh, if the maker market's large enough to warrant sensor companies devoting resources to making you know, some of the sensors and the development things open to a wider range of people. I know that, you know, obviously here on the Element 14 community, one thing that we do is we do a lot of road tests and things for people to take products and test them out. And uh, one of the feedbacks that we've const continuously gotten is that, you know, customers and a lot of the makers use products in ways that nobody, you know, with the uh, suppliers would ever think about using them. And then they see, oh my gosh, there's completely new applications we never thought about. Uh, do you guys look into the, you know, the maker markets or the, the broader market outside to get ideas in terms of where things are coming from or, where, you know, what ideas uh, uh, and types of sensors possibly to look into? What are your guys' thoughts on that? Yeah, I think from, um, uh, if I may, may take this one, but sorry. Yeah, so we have, um, from from the time that was, I was in the sales department, so I always found it really interesting to talking to the people um, who have their ideas and, and applications and think, yeah, of course, you can use a sensor for that as well. Um, and uh, from, at least for, for our products, uh, we have a lot of, of development kits or starter kits uh, to make it really accessible to start working with with the types of products that that Movella provides, eh? for example, inertial sensors. Um, so, uh, if you're really into uh, measuring motion or or something related to that, don't hesitate to to reach out um, okay. because we can uh, we can probably help you there. David, yeah. Jeff, just, you're, you're say yeah, just to, you know, the, the community is truly scalable. I think it's fantastic. Um, there's so much innovation that takes place. We we try to track that. We look at the, the boards that give us feedback on things we're doing right and things we're doing wrong and try to correct those. So yeah, we, we're big supporters of uh, getting feedback from, you know, the, the, whether it's the, the hobbyist or the people that are you know, doing their own tip of skunk works. Yep. Um, I think we have time for one more, and this is actually a good one. Uh, in terms of what you guys are working on, uh, you know, what are the most significant opportunities that are likely to arise for wearables for disease monitoring? Obviously, health is a is a ginormous issue. Anything that you guys can see uh, uh, that you that you're working on or that you're hearing about in terms of disease monitoring, what what are your thoughts there? Because now we got EKGs and stuff on our wrists. What's what's the next future? What's the next generation uh, going to bring Jeff, us? Jeff's, Jeff's probably got a better, probably even a better insight than I do. But just in general, I personally love. I'm probably considered a quantifier. I love quantifying everything about the stuff so I, I think that there's tremendous opportunity if you can baseline all your cardiovascular neurological type of uh, uh, aspects of your body then when you go to the doctor you look at when you're not healthy you can actually see what's going on so I, i'm a big believer jeff you got about a minute there you want you probably know the best 
Well, actually, this isn't a space, uh, this, you know, more disease monitoring that we're we really do much in uh, in consumer, but certainly with the the smart watches and everything that's going on in the space, like you said, is taking more and more data through various sensing technologies off the body, uh, from the body, and then using that data to predict health or to understand health. And I think to, you know part of this discussion has been a lot about sensors, but the other part's been about taking that data from the sensors and understanding what it means. And as we continue to evolve our sensor technologies, the evolution of how does a EKG plus pressure plus an oxygen level plus three weeks of only sleeping three hours a night because the Fitbit or whatever <laughs> said you're, you're not sleeping, that all means something to a doctor that understands the symptoms of a condition. And putting that all together and make into some smart, algorithms that then do prediction and understanding that that is also evolving as fast as sensor technology and i think it's just, yeah. it's just as important yeah it's a great thing to think about it i mean i just went for my physical and all we look at is the blood test we're now going to have all this additional data that they can look at and it's really watching changes over time you know most things don't happen in an instant except right. heart attacks but you know, that's, that's a great point. I think I think that's probably one of the most, I think it's probably one of the major areas that are, are going to continue to move us. Um, I know we're out of time today, you guys. Um, I wanted to thank uh, all of you for a great discussion, and hopefully, you know, everybody that joined um, got some good insights. Uh, really exciting area, and you guys are all leaders in your particular uh, industry. So just want to say thanks again, and thanks, everybody, for joining. Great. With that, Thank you very much. Take care, everybody.